by the ASC Board of Direction in 1960, the Terzaghi Lecture was established by what is now the Geo Institute in honor of Carl Terzaghi, of course. Annually, the Geo Institute Board of Governors recommends a distinguished engineer to deliver the Terzaghi Lecture. The 46th Terzaghi Lecture is Dr. Robert Holtz, PhD, PE, distinguished member of ASCE of the University of Washington. Our speaker tonight certainly has shown the expertise, innovation, and commitment that will match the example set by Carl Terzaghi and the other distinguished recipients of this renowned lectureship. I had the privilege of becoming acquainted with Bob about 10 years ago when I got involved in the Geo Institute, and it's been an extreme pleasure for me. I have benefited from Bob's work, from his example, from his insight, from his wisdom, from his wit, and, uh, and consider him a, a friend. Um, I would like now to have Dr. Holtz join me at the podium. Where is the old? Right here. I don't have enough hands to do this and get my glasses. No, this is this is good. This is good. Um, I have to read while I while I stand here. Bob, in recognition of your contributions as researcher, teacher, and consultant, that you have influenced uh, the state of the practice of geotechnical engineering, I would like to, pr to present you with this prestigious award. There we go. I very much look forward to your lecture tonight, and uh, now turn the time back to Ed for a minute. Thanks, Blaine. Well, this is clearly the best part of being president. You know, I got to introduce Ed Idris earlier in the meeting, and, and now I get to introduce Bob Holtz, colleagues who I've known for a long time, whose work I respect, uh, and who are being honored at this meeting. And Holtz is another one of those names that's familiar to almost all geotechnical engineers, certainly to everyone who's worked in geosynthetics. But Bob's contributions go well beyond his work in geosynthetics and includes important contributions to both geotechnical practice and, importantly, geotechnical engineering education. In fact, just like our Peck lecturer, whose name was paired with another geotechnical engineer, Bob's name is indelibly uh, etched into the minds of many geotechnical engineers, especially our younger colleagues, um, who have no connection whatsoever with geosynthetics reinforcement. Holtz and Kovacs, that's a, that's a phrase that many of us use frequently in the uh, engineering realm of geotechnical, uh, in the educational realm of geotechnical engineering. Uh, like Terzaghi and Peck or Lamb and Whitman, uh, Holtz and Kovacs has become the answer to the question, what book would you recommend to someone who wanted to gain a basic understanding of soil mechanics. Of course, probably the second most frequently asked question in that regard is, when are they going to finish that second edition? <laughs> I have it on good authority that it's done, that it's going to the printer or it's gone to the printer, so that's great news. And I'm sure Cricket also thinks that's great news, so that's Bob's wife. Um, Bob received his B.S. and M.S. degrees from the University of Minnesota and his Ph.D. from Northwestern University. Between his master's degree and his Ph.D., he attended the special program in soil mechanics at Harvard University, where I assume he had the opportunity to study under Arthur Casagrande. Bob's career has included 15 years on the faculty at Purdue University and then another 20 years at the University of Washington, where he is now a professor emeritus. He's worked as a research engineer or a visiting scientist in France at Terrasol and Ecole Nationale de Ponce Chose, in Italy at uh, Studio Geotechnico, in Sweden at the Swedish Geotechnical Institute and the Royal Institute of Technology, and in Canada. After Holtz and Kovacs, Bob is perhaps best known for his work on geosynthetics design. His guidance documents for FHWA and his books on the subject are essential references for anybody who works in geosynthetics. He was named an International Geosynthetic Society pioneer by the International Geosynthetic Society, and he's a distinguished member of ASCE. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the ASCE 2010 Terzaghi Lecturer, Professor Emeritus Robert Holtz. Um,
Thank you very much, Ed, for that very kind introduction, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is indeed a, a pleasure for me to, to be here, although I'll have to confess a, a twinge of nervousness, uh, especially when we plugged in the slides and found they were washed out just like they had been for most of the previous speakers. So let's hope that it's going to work now. Thanks to Steve Kramer, uh, I think I was saved. One of the disadvantages of being a slide rule engineer is that you are a little bit intimidated by some of this uh, modern technology. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, it, I really would like to thank the Ed and the Board of Governors for having selected me to present this lecture. And it's a bit uh, humbling and intimidating when I see uh, my previous, uh, or previous recipients of this award. I, I, I feel very, very humbled and at the same time very honored to join that group. I expect it's no surprise for those of you that know me that I probably would speak something about geosynthetics, and uh, that's indeed the case. Oh, before I begin, I have to show the uh, photographs that, the only two photographs I have of our, the namesake for this lecture, and that's uh, Professor Tsutsagi. Uh, see if I can get my pointer working. Uh, there he is uh, at a paper, Chelmon paper drain installation demonstration in uh, Helmschön, uh, north of Stockholm. And I think it's 1946, although this morning I looked at this and I thought, you know, it's probably 1947. But uh, somewhere then, uh, Professor Tsutsagi visited, this is Walter Chelmon, who was the first director of, this, uh, of the Swedish Geotechnical Institute. And clearly, uh, Professor Tsutsagi is interested in not only the, how those drains are likely to perform, but also in how they're installed. So that's my, uh, my acknowledgement of the tie that I have as second or third or fourth hand. These are not original photographs that I took, obviously, to uh, Professor Tsutsagi. When I started thinking about what I might talk about, I looked at the two previous Tsutsagi lecturers who have dealt with geosynthetics. Uh, my two, two of my geosynthetics heroes, uh, Professor Bob Kerner and Dr. J.P. Giroux. Uh, 1996, uh, Kerner spoke about geomembranes, and uh, although I've had a couple of master's projects on landfill covers, uh, no way would that information uh, be at all uh, even supplementary to uh, Dr. Kerner's uh, presentation. We've done quite a bit of work on geotextile filters, especially in the recent years, and I'm pretty proud of that. But I have to say, in comparison with the very brilliant uh, concept and idea that uh, Dr. Giroux gave us two years ago in New Orleans, the idea that what we have learned about geotextile filters, their performance and their behavior, helps us understand classical Tertsagi graded granular filter criteria is really, really quite, quite remarkable. And so I said, well, that leaves me two additional subjects that I happen to know a little about, geosynthetics and roads and geosynthetics for soil improvement. And I thought, I'll bet that most of the people here are more interested in reinforcement than they are in roads and highways. Uh, and don't sell roads and highways short because it turns out, I think we understand the geosynthetics function, but there are some soil mechanics issues. That interface, for example, a very simple geosynthetics or geotextile separator, and the behavior of that soil that we really don't understand. So I don't want to sell that short, uh, but I think the problems are largely geotechnical and soil mechanics and not geosynthetics. So that left me with reinforced soil. And uh, oh, a couple of other things I want to, uh, well, let's see if this, yeah, well, I think I've lost the slide in there. I wanted to mention a couple of things about, about uh, geosynthetics. And, and I'm sure that both uh, Bob Kerner and J.P. Giroux will agree with me that in such a short time, it's re quite remarkable that a development that was considered experimental, maybe even a little bit far out, uh, probably a, geotext a geotechnical fad, uh, and it'll never go anywhere. Uh, who's going to do some crazy thing like that has gone from those rather experimental 
concepts into what I would consider today a very routine. Landfills, municipal solid waste and hazardous waste landfills. Can't do them without geosynthetics. Pond liners, canal liners, in a lot of hard side transportation engineering, construction, in, um, and of course in geotechnical engineering. Geotextiles and geosynthetics have come from a, an essentially experimental uh, applications and experimental uh, yeah, applications to where they are standard, routine practice in so many of those areas. And that is quite remarkable. Another thing that, oh, I, I've lost another slide here. I, I wanted to mention one thing that Dr. Giroux said two years ago. He said that geosynthetics, and, and now I'm not sure, that since I've lost the quote, I'm not sure I can, uh, I can quote him exactly, but something to the effect that geosynthetics are the most important single development in civil engineering practice in the 20th century. And I challenge you to come up with a more important uh, development than geosynthetics in civil engineering practice. They clearly are the most important material since uh, pre-stressed concrete, which was, what, 100 years ago about, I think, when Fresnay developed pre-stressed concrete in the early part of last century. So anyway, here's what I want to do today uh, after that uh, little introduction. Uh, look at historical developments of reinforced soil. Uh, and I'll be a little bit personal there because uh, it's an opportunity for me to talk about some of the early things that I was involved in in Sweden and uh, also pay tribute to some of our predecessors who have really were the pioneers in, in this field. Then we will look at advantages and the basic behavior of geosynthetic reinforced soil, talk a bit about design and, and properties. You can't do design without properties. But those uh, remarks will, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I, I, my concept is that if you have uh, been involved in these things, you don't need any uh, introduction or lessons on, on uh, design details and how we determine material properties. They're available in standard references, and you can get that information if you would like it. Uh, we still need, uh, there are a few things that we still need to do. Uh, a couple of these are technical, and there are several professional issues, and then we'll finish up with some examples and final remarks. Someone has said that there's nothing new under the sun, and that's probably true. If you want to look at soil reinforcing, you can go to uh, nature, some, uh, nat uh, some examples, adobe bricks, and uh, if you think about it, that's a very good analogy with reinforced concrete. We have a material that basically is a rather low strength. And uh, we put it together with something a little higher strength, and the composite material uh, provides a lot of technical uh, ad advantages. So I think the analogy is very apt. Ancient Mesopotamia was the home of a number of these large ziggurats, as shown in that map. There are, uh, there's one here, one photograph on the left, the ziggurat of al Quf. And each one of those horizontal lines are about a meter apart uh, is reinforcing with either woven reed or palm frond mats. Highly biodegradable, and you wonder how that lasted 3,500 3, years. Well, the climatic conditions and the bio conditions were such that it managed to survive. Now you say, well, it's a ruins, yeah, but it's 3,500 years old, and it's not doing too badly. The Great Wall of China is another example uh, especially the western wall, shown here, really looks a lot like uh, layers of something. I'm not sure what it is. I got this photograph from somebody else. But it's very definitely a good model of reinforced soil. So clearly, in our predecessors have known how to do a lot of things which don't look too different than what we do now. My introduction to soil reinforcing and geosynthetics uh, started when I was working at the Swedish Geotechnical Institute in the early 1970s. Uh, the gentleman on the left is Oleg Wager, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was the inventor, the idea person. And Bank Brahms uh, was my boss, and, or our boss, and, and my collaborator on a lot of uh, some early work that we did on reinforced soil. So I'd like to acknowledge their contribution. 
Oleg Wagner started reinforcing embankments on soft ground in the mid 60s, uh, provided a, or did a test at a, a town in southwestern Sweden called Elvängen. Uh, this was a test embankment with short sheet piles and tie rods to stiffen the base of the embankment. Uh, this uh, section of uh, tests that you see are actually an installation on the lower uh, left is near the first installation of geosynthetics. And they use these short sheet piles to reinforce a soft ground uh, situation uh, in a, a, a reconstruction of a highway there in 1971. On the uh, lower right there, you see how Uleg uh, designed that, those tie rods for stability. That's a simple analysis, a circular arc, a simple moment equilibrium, etc. This is exactly the same process we use if we want to design the geosynthetic for a circular type of failure, edge failure, on a reinforced embankment on soft ground. Well, the first geosynthetic uh, installation was in 1971. Uh, I took these photographs myself, and I can show you the, the old slides. If you see the date printed on them, and so it's easy to go back and confirm that. Uh, it's, the geosynthetic was a woven multi-filament polyester woven by a, a, a company that uh, uh, worked in Borås, Sweden, called uh, Fudervevneter. And uh, you notice down here in the lower, uh, well, and that was a test. Uh, drove that uh, D4 over the geosynthetic to see what would happen. And we looked at it. It had a few holes in it. Said, ah, it doesn't matter. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've learned since then that that really did cause a lot of damage to especially a multi-filament uh, woven polyester. The company was kind enough to give us a few thousand kroner to do a, uh, some lab tests. And our concept was that we wanted to look at the pullout resistance. That's the way we thought and a reinforced embankment would behave, that the geosynthetic might pull out of the toes of the slope. That, that was kind of a simple-minded approach. We didn't really understand a lot what we were doing. There was certainly no theory, and uh, neither Uleg nor I were very analytical, and so that was just conceptual. And uh, we had a box uh, there. It was available. It was way too small. But that was what was available, and so it was kind of put together with, uh, with uh, I was going to say nickels and dimes, but it was kroner and ure to try to make some simple tests. And they, we had a little bag here down in the bottom, you can kind of see that, to put air pressure on there. And based on that, we learned quite a bit on how pull-out, how synth geosynthetics work in pull-out. Now, there were some other questions there, and I won't go into a lot of details. We published this in the first uh, conference on, in, on geosynthetics, or actually fa use of fabrics and geotechnics. It was in Paris in 77. And one of the things we found was that uh, if you fiddled with the data right, you could come up with an interface friction angle that was quite close to the friction angle of a sand. Uh, well, you got plane strain, triaxial. There are a lot of other questions. And some other questions associated with this that uh, it was a little bit uh, sketchy, but uh, you know, it's kind of a first shot at it. Um, but also as a footnote, I have to say that ASTM has a standard for pull out, and that's the one that I don't think is correctly interpreted. And uh, that's a subject for a whole nother, uh, nother uh, lecture. Well, this led to some experiments. By then, we were aware of Henri Vidal and the French uh, Terre Armée reinforced earth. And this led to some experiments at the Swedish Geotechnical Institute in 1974. That's a photograph of my daughter, who was five years old then. And then the next year at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, a large test pit uh, with airbags and then this X-frame to provide a reaction against putting a normal stress on there. And there were some results that were found. And, we did some pin model tests, Taylor Schneebele model tests, and uh, different lengths of reinforcing and different configurations. And a lot of that was summarized in, in a paper that Bengt and I wrote for a symposium on soil reinforcement in Sydney. This is obviously not chronological, because Henri Vidal started uh, sometime in the, in the early to mid-60s. I have a question mark on his date there, because I'm not sure if he's still alive. Uh, but uh, he was born in 1924, and uh, this is the first paper of his that is in my collection, 
was uh, published on reinforced earth in, in 19, uh, or La Terre Armée in 1966. These photographs are taken from that publication. Uh, you notice up here in the upper corner on the right uh, a series of, of, uh, of gravel pieces, and I think this was paper. And then he shows a cross section with that metal skin, similar to what's shown on the photograph on the, on the left. And there's an aerial view or, uh, of, the, of the site under construction with the metal strips, the metal st skin, and then the backfill. The first real job that I can determine uh, was uh, in, by the French uh, Road Authority constructed this auto route uh, near Nice in, in south of France uh, sometime in the late 60s. Uh, this was a very, very successful project. Uh, Francois Slaucher told me that they had paid, it, they saved enough money on this project that they could pay for the entire research budget at L'Evitoire Central for four years. So it was a very successful project. Uh, you can get an idea from these photographs on, on the left, the size of the wall, and on the right, this is a photograph taken from Ken Lee's uh, publication, uh, the three components that go into the classical reinforced earth. The backfill soil, a metal skin or some kind of a skin, and uh, metal ties, steel. It didn't take too long before you realize that that metal skin on the face has some problems, uh, construction and, and uh, a few other things. And so uh, Vidal then went to this, this classical uh, cruciform uh, precast concrete element. I visited France the uh, first time in 1976. And uh, this gentleman on the left was kind enough to pose for me. And you see very clearly the three components. The metal strips going into the backfill and the precast concrete face element. At the central laboratories, they also were doing some work on, uh, with the Taylor Schneebele model, these rods, which are very nice little models for, to model a granular material in two dimensions. Uh, some bunkers down here on the lower left, a, a two-tier wall, as you see here on upper left, and uh, reminded me of some similar studies we did at the uh, Swedish, uh, Royal Swedish Geotechnical Institute the previous summer. The first use of reinforced earth in the United States was in 1972 to repair a landslide in Southern California in the Angeles National Forest. And uh, you can see they use, the, again, the metal strips uh, for the facing. And there's another construction view up here. These were taken from, from um, oh, such magazines. It was ENR, and there were a few other magazines that I scanned these photographs from. The first research that was done on uh, reinforced soil was by Professor Ken Lee uh, at UCLA. He had two NSF projects, uh, one on, um, on static uh, behavior and stability and one on, on uh, seismic stability of reinforced soil. Uh, he unfortunately was killed in a skiing accident in uh, 1978 uh, and uh, I think we lost a real giant in our profession. The Looking down on this slope, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a scarp, or sorry, wall, it's not a slope. You can see a scarp back here. It's essentially a plane failure. There's obviously some edge effects. Uh, but the wall has moved out about 50 millimeters, is supported, so it's prevented from utter collapse. And you notice these uh, bands, shear bands in here with the colored soil uh, at very close to 45 plus phi upon 2. So the, when they developed their design method, you kind of go to classical earth pressure theory. It sort of seemed to make sense. Now, an interesting thing is that one of Ken Lee's slides shows this, a collapse if he didn't support the wall and, uh, and, he, and things occurred that would cause collapse. It was a serious collapse and that does or has happened very rarely in the field. Well, uh, I'm not sure why this happened, but the French also did some experiments back in the early 70s, uh, full-scale experiments uh, with a uh, needle punch non-woven polyester fabric, uh, built these test walls here. Of, oh, they're probably a meter and a half or so high. And the first US uh, 
Construction with the geosynthetic reinforced walls was done in Oregon and Washington in the early 70s by the U.S. Forest Service, uh, John Stewart, John Money, and their colleagues, and uh, Professor Dick Bell uh, uh, was a professor at uh, Oregon State. Uh, this is the very first wall they built in the Siskiyou National Forest in southern uh, Oregon. And the, federal, and sorry, the Forest Service put together some guidelines on the use of fabrics. The Federal Highway uh, reproduced as shown here in this, uh, this document. A few photographs from some of those early constructions uh, that uh, Dick Bell gave me. Uh, the uh, Siskiyou National Forest job, with the, they had two different geosynthetics. Uh, this one is the Olympic National Forest, uh, out, you know, just north of, uh, of, of Olympia, Washington. And then in, they found they had to do some shot creating on the face to prevent deterioration uh, from, uh, by ultraviolet light or vandalism. This led to some research that uh, Dick Bell and, and his colleague Gary Hicks uh, did at Oregon State for Federal Highway uh, 1980, the first report this, uh, an interim report. The second report, oops, let me go back. The second report, uh, for, for some reason, was never published by FHWA, and I've never known why. I thought it was, the project was very successful and some very good work. The geosynthetics courses that Ed mentioned uh, actually were started about the same time. Al Halliburton at Oklahoma State, who also died rather young, and uh, unfortunately. And uh, the second contract with Barry Christopher and myself, since then I'm guessing that probably 150 different courses have been given around the states. And if you permit me to brag a little, I think it is fair to say that it has significantly increased the use and improved the specifications used by state highways in the U.S. And I have to show you the photograph of that first manual. It was called geotextile manual because this was before geogrids or any of the other family of geosynthetics had been developed. Uh, and it was uh, two reams of paper thick. I guess we were quite verbose in those days. There was a, lo there a lot of additional work that was done at Purdue and of course it was very tempting to, to tell you about some of that but in the interest of time we'll move on. So let me show you a few advantages and some of the basic behavior of geosynthetic reinforced soil. One of the primary advantages, and I guess a good engineering property of reinforced soil is its cost. When you get very high with any kind of wall, up, you're talking about 10, 11, 12 meters, there's almost no competition. Uh, we measure wall costs by dollars per square meter, dollars per face of, of the, dollars per square foot of the face of the wall. And this data now is a little old, so you may want to multiply these numbers by one or one and a half or maybe even two to get the, today's dollars. But I didn't bother changing them because I don't have any recent data on this. And uh, you see that when you're just talking about steel reinforced walls or just synthetic reinforced walls, they're significantly cheaper than any of their conventional structural competition. The Rainier Avenue wall here, which was a fabric reinforced wall, is a little unfair to compare because it did not have any facing. It was a temporary wall. But had we wanted to put a face on that, or have the state DOT had wanted to, they could have used about $100 per square meter for hiring an architect or an artist or done a lot of fancy things for that kind of money. So, uh, oops, let's go on. Other advantages, flexibility, settlement tolerance means cheaper foundations. You, it's easy to change alignment and grade with the geosynthetic reinforced soil, actually any reinforced soil. Seismic stability, because they are flexible, is greater with these structures. Simple rapid construction. Uh, we'd like the idea that sometimes we have a green face, and that's easy to do with reinforced systems. We can go to steeper slopes than we otherwise could with either cohesive or granular backfills. And uh, there's increased safety. Uh, Barry Christopher and Jonathan Cheng did a study, uh, it was published in one of the geosynthetics conferences, that for the same calculated factor of safety, there's a lower probability of failure and a greater reliability for a reinforced steeper slope than for an unreinforced flatter slope at the same factor of safety. 
So you might ask the question, why do we still design and construct unreinforced soil slopes so we can make them safer by, by increase their reliability by, uh, by the use of geosynthetics? This photograph shows some very important characteristics of reinforced soil. Uh, you notice there's no facing retaining the soil. And you say, well, that's unfair because the sheets of geosynthetic are really close uh, to the same size as the particles, and that's unfair. But this rounded aggregate would not stand at nearly that steep a slope angle if it wasn't for the reinforcing. And it kind of reminded me of this photograph that Vidal had in 1966. But that happens in the field also. This photograph on the left, upper left, you can see those layers of geosynthetics and there's no facing. The stuff is falling down, the soil is falling down. And the photograph on the lower left, or lower right, is from Glenwood Canyon, test walls that were built by the Colorado Department of Highways. You can see the geosynthetic layers there as a wrap face wall. And this has been there at that time that uh, Tony Allen took this photograph. has been there uh, eight years through winters, freeze thaw, everything, and it's still standing. And you say, well, how is that possible? Well, clearly there's enough silt or moisture in there that you get a little apparent cohesion and it's able to stand at least between those layers of reinforcing. And that's true here too. Bob Barrett, a good friend of mine, uh, built these, this test wall uh, out of, uh, these are bed sheets from Walmart. And uh, stacked them up, put a jersey barriers up there, and here there's no face down here about halfway down. And sure, you can see the angle of repose. This very nicely shows what that angle of repose is of that soil. And you wonder, now how's that standing there? Well, again, there's enough silt, enough moisture that it provides apparent cohesion that it's able to stand and, un and support remarkable loads. So the conclusions. Stress at the face is very small. The face is only local and it's only necessary to hold the soil between the layers or for aesthetics. You don't need to have big, heavy structural elements unless you have large spacings between the layers of reinforcing. And then I have to show you this, Texol, that's a continuous filament reinforced soil, uh, some experiments that we did in our laboratory, and you can see the angle of repose, and then the reinforced angle is about 75 degrees. So let's talk a bit about design, and I want to again go back to historical, uh, uh, a historical approach. Uh, GRS walls developed as a combination of conventional earth pressure theory, ranking and plus terror maze, uh, suggestions for failure modes, a design approach of Ken Lee and Dick Bell in this country that led to the tieback wedge approach, as it's called, and it turns out to be very conservative. Now for slopes, reinforced slopes, those started from a different approach. Uh, used classical slope stability analyses with essentially tieback forces or some kind of a reinforcing force going behind uh, the, the calculated failure surface. So I ask you a question. What's the difference between a GRS slope, a geosynthetic reinforced slope, and a very steep GRS slope? When does a very steep slope become a wall? Does the soil know the difference? I'm not sure. I thank Bob Kerner for this uh, idea. I didn't think about it myself, but I had a discussion with him one time, and he said, our design approaches depend on traditional geotechnical designs for slopes and retaining walls, and on the way we teach this, these subjects in our graduate courses. It has nothing to do with reality. And he's right. We have, at the University of Washington, we have a course on slope stability. It's one of our graduate courses, and we have a course on retaining structures. And never the twain shall meet. So I thought, gee, that's really strange. I'm going to check and see what the experts said. So I went to two books on geosynthetics engineering. And the guys on the left, they've got a chapter 8 on reinforced soil slopes and chapter 9 on reinforced soil walls. So I thought, well, you know, what do they know? Let's go look and see what Professor Kerner said. And he has the same thing. The exact same thing. So I think we still got a little bit to do.
come up with a unified approach. I have one suggestion for you that may, may do that, but it's, uh, it's very new. Well, our model uh, shown on the, on the uh, left, uh, assume failure surface, that's where that wedge comes from, and then the tiebacks are going into the, into the, uh, the soil back here. An assumed earth pressure distribution, including surcharges or anything you want to do, that's up to you. The failure modes were patterned after the, the reinforced earth, ties breaking, ties pull out. We consider the geosynthetics rupturing and, uh, excuse me, ge or geosynthetics pulling out. And uh, for design, uh, conventional, uh, conventional designs for structural walls are followed in this case, bearing capacity, overturning, sliding, and overall slope stability. Internal stability, several approaches, and I'll go into that, and I want to talk a bit about sedate, uh, drainage and seismic issues. External stability is important. Clearly this wall has failed in bearing capacity. You can see the classical shape of the prandtl surface that's come up in front of the, of the uh, failed uh, wall, it failed in bearing capacity. But notice it didn't fall down. It did not collapse. It's damaged, but it did not collapse. One of the real advantages of reinforced soil over our structural uh, systems. Here's a case here where in the lower uh, figure where the toe capacity was lost, looks like a landslide, overall stability must have been compromised. This happens a lot, way too often. These are geotechnical problems, my friends. These are not geosynthetics or reinforced problems. Current design methods, there are a number that have been published, uh, assuming a different kind of, uh, of earth pressure distribution. Uh, and uh, why did I say they're conservative? Well, when you start to look with uh, data that we've collected uh, from uh, back analysis of measurements in real structures, well, we usually report this material in terms of, or our measurements in terms of some kind of an earth pressure coefficient. Sounds similar to, to the coefficient of active earth pressure, which is calculated from a knowledge of the internal friction angle. So the sigma h is measured. Well, it's measured, usually we're measuring strains on the, on the metal ties or in the geosynthetic, converting those to stresses, somehow uh, attributing that to a tributary area that that particular reinforcing layer or element is supporting, and compare that with the overburden stress at that elevation. Problem is that we find the measured KH is often less than KA. And that's impossible for reasons shown here. KA, or the H sub A that you get, uh, uh, H sub, sigma sub HA that you get at, at the active earth pressure condition is the minimum case, and any kind of figure that goes beyond that or any kind of measurement there is, is not possible with a, some conditions that we've seen. Now, I've got some suggestions on why I think uh, these field measurements often come out that way. One is the soil properties. More failure envelopes are curved, especially at, at uh, low confining pressures. So the friction angle is probably much higher than that triaxial friction angle that you calculate based on 100, 200, 300 uh, kilopascal uh, confining pressures or something like that. The triaxial friction angle is much less than the friction angle in plane strain. At field densities, you've got a high friction angle. It's a lot higher than it is at looser conditions. Ranking theory is violated by the presence of the reinforcement. Ranking assumed a homogeneous backfill. A little cohesion goes a long way. And that must have influenced some of our field measurements. But is it always there? Well, I don't know. Soils dry out, are they gonna get wet and destroy, you could destroy the parent cohesion? I don't really know. And field measurements, anybody that's ever tried to do field measurements, you know you always have problems. In interpretation, there are anomalies, temperature, straight currents, something always goes wrong with measurements, and so it's real easy to blame the measurements. So that's retaining walls, or reinforced, slope wall, reinforced uh, soil walls. Let's talk about reinforced slopes. And it's a combination of classical slope stability analyses and tieback forces, as I mentioned earlier. But let's consider a little bit how granular slopes actually fail and how stability analyses are performed. And I've started with the sand at the angle of repose, and then we're going to increase the slope angle a bit. 
And uh, let's take a slope at 26 degrees. Well, it's probably safe, especially if the friction angle is 30 or more, 40. Uh, if it's a compacted clay, it's probably safe at one on two. But if you want to build a slope at 38 degrees and your friction angle is 35, you may have problems making that. And what will happen if, how much reinforcement is needed in the upper one? Well, none. How much do you need in the lower one? Well, you'll need a little. You may not need very much, but you'll need a little. And interestingly, what happens when it fails? If you tilt that sand layer up, you'll find a few grains start to roll off down the surface. You got a maintenance problem. You're not going to get a catastrophic failure. And if you make it 45 degrees, you're going to need a little more, a little more uh, uh, reinforcing. And if you make it real steep, you're going to need a lot of reinforcing to keep it stable. Uh, I have a note down here at the bottom about Richard Jewell and the pull-out paradox, but I think in the interest of time, I'll pass on that. Slope design approaches are very similar to what we do with, uh, with any conventional slope. Uh, you assume some kind of a sliding surface, and there are a whole bunch of them shown over here, and there are a bunch of procedures that have been developed over the years, and I show a few of these, these uh, models that have been, been used at different times. There are a lot of computer programs that are available, developed either by the government or by commercial uh, entities. Uh, they all, almost all have some kind of subroutine available for uh, reinforcing. Uh, I, as far as I know, they're okay. I think if you're tempted to use one of those, I recommend you take a look at uh, Chapter 8 of Duncan and Wright's textbook so you understand a little bit about what's going into those, into those programs. Some other design considerations, the spacing of the reinforcing, overall slope stability I already mentioned is a, is a just technical problem. Internal drainage, backfill soils, are they free draining? Very, very important. Seismic design and some constructability and site access. Obviously, I don't have time to go into all these details, but, uh, but uh, let me just comment a bit about spacing. You have two choices as a designer. You can use many thin layers thin lifts of low strength geosynthetics as a reinforcing advantage, better compaction, but it's going to take you a little more time to place the geosynthetic layers and to place the soil. But although that, you have to place the soil in fairly, fairly thin lifts anyway to get good, good compaction. Or you can go to a few thick layers of very high strength products, geosynthetics, take you less time to construct it, although as I said, you still have to compact it, uh, you may have excessive face deformations, and that means there could be extra problems or other problems in, so, in supporting the face or having short intermediate layers of geosynthetics. So those are your choices as, as a designer. Let me talk a little bit about uh, some work that we've done at the University of Washington, an analytical work. It was primarily by using FLAC uh, as our uh, analysis program. Uh, two students, Wei Li, and uh, Fuzzy Seiden. And I'm quite proud of their work, and that's why I want to just summarize briefly what they've done. Now, Wei Li uh, analyzed uh, geosynthetic reinforced walls and developed a working stress analysis that really was the basis of what we were calling today the case stiffness method. The model was calibrated with field and lab data from Rainier Avenue wall. So we have a calibrated model. Uh, we used the plane strain friction angle and the modulus at low confining pressures. Use the correct dilation angle. Uh, he did the test himself, so he knew what the values were. And they're quite high at low confining pressures. A lot higher than the FLAC default value of zero. Class A predictions of three uh, test walls were built through Royal Military College in Canada and got quite good agreement. You can, using uh, modern analytical techniques uh, get pretty good idea of external and internal performance if you use the correct material properties and the correct boundary conditions. Well, surprise, surprise, <laughs> the right information in there, you can get a good answer. And just to show you a few of, of uh, ways uh, results for deflection up here in the upper left and then the distribution of reinforcement strains as compared with the measurements. So we felt pretty good about that. Um, Fuzzy Seiden did a back analysis of an instrumented wall that was built in Louisiana 
by the Louisiana Transportation Research Council. Uh, and you see some of the, uh, the specifications there on the wall and what she did. And she was concerned about not only the compressible foundation, but the effect of the drainage of the backfill material because it was quite fine-grained uh, uh, sandy clay or silty clay material. Got a lot of pretty pictures. I, I love these modern analytical techniques. I'm not sure I understand all that stuff, but I love the pretty pictures that, that you're able to get. And she had some very important design recommendations. Traditional design methods are okay for these structures on compressible foundations. Most of the previous work that's been done assume no yielding in the foundations. So that's not, uh, it, thankfully, not going to be a serious problem. The there was a reinforced base layer that was used at the uh, LTRC uh, wall, and that led to more uniform settlements, as you might expect. Traditional settlement analysis. You design for ultimate stability and then you define for serviceability. You can do what you would normally do, what we teach in, in our undergraduate soil mechanics courses for how to calculate the settlement on cohesive foundations. Fine. But you've got to pay attention to the rates of construction, and especially in modeling, and that is not easy. And adequate provisions for drainage are critical. Uh, when Barry Christopher and I do these courses sometimes, with, somebody says, what's the three most important things in soil reinforcing? And it's drainage, drainage, drainage. And is this anything new? I got these sketches from Tetsagi Theoretical Soil Mechanics, 1943. Standard geotechnical engineering. So if we want to design for drainage, we, know, we should know how to do that. And there are some wonderful designs available in the literature uh, on how to do good drainage on a reinforced backfill structure. There are some other approaches to design. Uh, some of the early work at Davis in the early 70s uh, used a composite material approach in their finite element work. Uh, Wei Li and, and uh, my colleague Pedro Arduino and, our, and, um, and another student uh, did some work that was published in the in the Geosynthetics Conference. Uh, the case stiffness method I mentioned earlier was uh, developed with Tony Allen and, uh, and Richard Bathurst. Uh, we used an empirical uh, analysis based on many case histories, so you say field data. Of course, you can always criticize the, whether the data is accurate, but at least there's a lot of case histories. Uh, we give a, um, we think, a more accurate estimate of reinforcement loads and a step-by-step de uh, step -step design procedure was developed. Uh, let me acknowledge uh, Tony Allen and Richard Bathurst. And uh, now my recommendations for design. What should you do? Well, if you want to use traditional limiting equilibrium methods, uh, number one, use the correct soil properties. Make sure that the confining pressure, the gamma H, is realistic. And if you can, do plain strain, device, plain strain tests on your sand. That's not so easy. There are not many devices available, and it's hard to conduct a plain strain or triaxial tests at low confining pressures. And if you're going to do some modeling and you want to get the right answer, you've got to get the right dilatancy angle. For internal stability or designs of various, very steep slopes, reinforced slope, well, I'd suggest you design them as <clears throat> a very steep slope. As the slope angle increases, you're going to need more reinforcement for stability. And I haven't done this, but you might want to try a soil nailing program or a tieback program with adjustments for the geometry and properties of the reinforcement. And I should think that would work fine. I, li I like the idea of thin layers of weaker reinforcement. First, it's cheaper, and you get better face control. But that, again, is a designer's choice. It's up to you. Pull out. Not a problem, forget about it. Based on our research uh, back at the, in Sweden in the 70s, the geosynthetic will rupture before it pulls out with any kind of depth of burial. And if you have a problem, as sometimes happens on site, that uh, the contractor dumps a load of gravel right at the wall face and the wall tilts over, do what John Paulson and Mike Bernardi do in, in Atlanta, and they put the top two or three layers way back of what they need for stability. Cheap insurance. 
And don't forget drainage, drainage, drainage. And also, I'd like for you to try the case stiffness method and tell us if it works. So you can't do design without properties, so let's go to properties. What are the components, soils, geosynthetics, and the facing system? So properties that you, as usual, I don't need to tell practicing geotechnical engineers uh, how to do that. Uh, the Federal Highway and RECO have very good specifications on the backfill. Uh, the limit of 6 PI, uh, I think it's 15% passing the 200. I think those are very good. And the foundation and slope where a lot of our problems occur, it's good traditional geotechnical engineering. And in my opinion, there's no excuse for not doing that properly. We know how to do that. Drainage, drainage, drainage. Don't forget that. Uh, let's look at the geosynthetic properties. Uh, basically, tensile strength, soil geosynthetic friction, creep, dur durability, and installation damage. I'm not going to spend time on those because I think those are available elsewhere. Uh, but I just want to point out that ASTM has done us a fantastic service by, uh, in the last 20, 25 years, developing all these standard tests for us. For, as you see them listed there, tensile strength and tension creep and soil geosynthetic friction and so on and so on. Uh, the previous chairs of ASTM and I guess the current chairs, Dave Suits, uh, Trudy Rauman, uh, John Ball, uh, Dave, uh, Barry Christopher, who am I missing? Oh, Dave Wyant, and I'm probably missing a couple of others. Uh, there, we, the profession owes them a d deep gret of deep deep debt of gratitude for all their hard work on these, uh, these ASTM tests because you can call for those and there are labs in the country that will do those for you. There's no excuse for not, not using the correct properties on your site soils and your geosynthetics. Let me talk a little bit about some experimental work that we've done at the University of Washington. My student Stan Boyle did some in isolation and low, in soil load elongation tests tests sponsored by WashDOT. Uh, based on the performance of this wall, which at the time it was built was the highest uh, geosynthetic wall in the world. It was almost uh, 13 meters high, supported a large surcharge. Uh, it was well instrumented. Barry Christopher and I did the instrumentation on it, and it performed amazingly well. And I don't have time to go into the details, but I just want to point out one thing, and that is the strains that were measured, both by mechanical extensometers and electrical strain gauges, were all less than about a percent. So this is a soil that, if you talk about pullout, we're not even getting ready to pull this thing out. It's, you're down at the very beginning of the stress strain curve. So um, we developed, uh, with uh, the support of Washington State DOT, uh, unit cell device is what Stan called it. It's basically a plane strain device where the geosynthetic is in the center of this block of sand, airbags top and bottom that are putting stresses on, and it models an element that would be taken out of the middle of a reinforced soil slope or wall. And we can measure the loads that are developed as well as the deformations in the soil. Loads are developed in the geosynthetics. And to show you some of his results, he worked on two sands. We started with the Rainier Avenue sand, the Royal, uh, sorry, Soil R, and he got some crazy results. And said, put Ottawa sand in there, at least you'll get some decent results. Well, we found some weird things. But one thing you find at low confining pressures in plain strain, those friction angles are high. They're a lot higher than that 35 degrees or 34 degrees that FHWA says is a default value. Huge safety factor built in there. So that's the first thing. Second, look at the stress-strain relation of soil and the geosynthetic together. Uh, no, no geosynthetic, uh, lightweight non-woven, a little heavier weight. Uh, these are woven geotextiles that were used in the Rainier Avenue wall. And again, we have no way to scale those, and I suggested to Stan that he try steel. Uh, there's the stainless steel yields at about 0.23%, which is what steel's supposed to do. And uh, you put a ruler on that and convert uh, from KPA and all that, you get about 30 million PSI. <laughs> so that gave us some confidence that we're probably in the right ballpark for these geosynthetics. Interestingly, what we're interested in, really in terms of behavior, is rather small strains at working stresses. 
And the third thing that Stan did that I think is quite remarkable is uh, he did some what we would call relaxation tests. Uh, I've, on the left are uh, de definitions of, of uh, creep and stress relaxation. And on the right is uh, just some selected data that Stan uh, did. These were incremental tests, so it was easy to do. And he carried it up to a certain strain and a certain load, in the measured strain in the, uh, uh, measured load in the, in the geosynthetic, and then release things. So the pressures are constant, just as they would not be in the field. Deformations occur, and the load in the geosynthetic decreased. So how is creep going to occur? In other words, it relaxes to a constant stress level, and if the stresses don't increase, it can't creep. So that's why I say, don't worry about creep. It's not a problem, not an issue. Stan's bottom line, or based on his research for geosynthetic reinforced wall designers, for the interaction behavior and the, if you're going to look at that, the induced reinforcement tension must be measured directly. Otherwise, you're just guessing at what that force in the geosynthetic is. And the UCD is the only test that does that, that we know about. This probably isn't very good for our friends in the steel reinforcing industry, but geosynthetics are a much more efficient reinforcing system than steel. And because the strengths of both the sand and the geosynthetic are used more or less equally. With sand and steel, the steel takes most of the load. And soil just kind of goes along for the ride. You're only using about a third of the available strength with steel reinforcing. Now that, you know, you can say, well, that's not a lot of expense and so on. But if you want to have a real efficient composite system, use a geosynthetic. Creep of geosynthetic walls is not really a problem at working stresses because, as I pointed out there with the data, when loading stops, GRS deforms as the geosynthetic relaxes. It's in equilibrium and no longer moves, as long as external internal conditions don't change. And this has also been shown by the field measurements at Rainier Avenue and uh, by the steep geograd reinforced walls that John Fannin uh, built and has monitored in Norway. If you still think it's a problem, you can do some isochronous uh, load versus strain curves, and you can do some time temperature superposition, and uh, I'd like to refer you to Bob Kerner and Grace Swan and Scott Thornton on how to do all that. Uh, you can use the British standard uh, for reinforced soil, British standard 8007, where 10,000 hour creep data is extrapolated to 120 years approximately. And John Fannin has shown very, very nicely that you take the BS 8007 procedure and the AASHTO procedure with the Reinf uh, with the reduction factors, the creep reduction factors, and you end up with very close to the same allowable stress. So you can come out it whatever way you want, and you kind of get, as far as the designer is concerned, the same answer. And all bets are off with fine grain soils. I don't know what to do about that. There still are some things that we need to know and do. Uh, they're primarily technical, or there are some technical, and, and then some professional issues. Things we still need to know and do technically. GRS is quite mature, uh, but we sure could use a simpler or a poor man's, I hate, I hate to use that word, but I put it in quotes, plain strain device. Something that would, we could cheaply do in practice to get the plain strain strength of sands and at the same time measure the volume changes during, uh, during a shear. I, I'd like to see a better seismic design procedure than Mononobe Okabe. Even though we know GRS structures are safer than conventional, we still need to do a design and make sure they're safe in seismic uh, events. Uh, my colleague Steve Kramer assures me that performance-based earthquake engineering is the way to go, and I encourage him and his students and the rest of you that are earthquake folks to, uh, to help us a lot with that. It would, that would be enormous benefit to us. The rest of my uh, things that I still think we need to do have to do with professional issues. There are frankly too many failures. Uh, most are due to poor quality backfill, poor drainage, construction problems, inadequate global or external stability, a geotechnical problem. 
unexpected surcharges, etc. There's often a disconnect between the wall designer, the geotech of record, and the site civil. This is very true in private development work. And it's complicated because the wall designs were supplied by the material supplier distributor and not provided by the geotech. That leads to lots and lots of problems and to be honest, a lot of consulting work or forensic work uh, for some of my friends and colleagues. There are other problems, lack of proper inspection, no control of construction by the designer. There are economic pressures that lead to these value engineered or contracted supplied designs with no money available for checking those alternate designs by a competent professional. Poor training of workers, that's why you see the grids roll down parallel to the face of the wall when the strong di direction of the grids it should be perpendicular to the face of the wall. Those poor guys out there, they want to do a good job, but they don't know any better. No one told them. Question, and this is what I've heard an excuse for not doing design is, well, there's, the liability is too high, and that's why we'll have a vendor to supply design. And I wonder, is that true? If not, then why give away those billable hours? And uh, it should be obvious, I guess, fixing problems <laughs> is always more expensive than doing proper inspection and, and compaction and, and construction control by the designer. But we seem to keep learning these lessons over and over again. How to fix these state affairs, I don't know. Can the GI do something about this? ASFE, I should have put, seeing Blaine Leonard sitting there, I should have put ASCE there. Because many of these issues are not unique to geosynthetic reinforced soil. They are endemic in our society. And there's another problem, and I'm sure that Ed Cavazanjan and the GI board are aware of this, and I hope they'll do something to correct it, but that's this jurisdictional issue that many require, small cities, counties, uh, and so on, require that GRS wall, and I put that in quotes, designed to be stamped by a registered structural engineer. And I'll, I'll be honest, some of my best friends are structural engineers. And you know, they're wonderful people and they know a lot about designing structures, but you know, to be honest, they don't know very much about geosynthetics. I've never found one that did or that wanted to know very much about geosynthetics. And they know a little bit about soil, which they've learned from their undergraduate soil mechanics and they probably don't know a lot about drainage. And furthermore, even though they've stamped this drawing or this uh, design, they are not responsible for the construction inspection. Somehow that got lost in the, in the mess. The result again, too many failures, they're costly, potentially tragic. So far as, as I know, no one has been killed by the collapse of, of a GRS wall or, or structure, but there have been some close calls. And uh, that's not acceptable, that violates our fundamental canon, canon number one of the ASCE, uh, about the health and safety of the public. And so that, this is not acceptable. So, ladies and gentlemen, we still have much work to do. So I want to show you some examples. I call this the spin section uh, because uh, I don't want to leave that on that sour note of, oh, we've got all this bad stuff's happening, all these things, and, you know, I, I don't know, that didn't set well. So I'm not going to show you any pictures of failures. I'll show you successful examples. And I'll run through these kind of rapidly so that we can finish up here. Founders Meadow structure uh, near Denver. Uh, this is a bridge on a shallow foundation on a reinforced soil abutment, performed beautifully. Uh, Bob Barrett in Colorado has done a lot of very interesting work with, with uh, different uh, precast elements, timber, uh, native stone, and so on, uh, leaving outcrops and, and so on. I think they're really quite remarkable structures. Um, a lot of the wall manufacturers where they have precast face elements uh, do a lot of things that, to make them less ugly. Uh, the modular block, the seg segmental uh, block walls, uh, a number of those, and you can see things like offsets and, and uh, changing grade and alignment are done very easily and very nicely. A lot of failures in those for all those reasons I mentioned earlier. The green solution that's shown down here in the, in the lower left is uh, in a wet climate uh, uh, near where we're from. And uh, Taiwan's a similar case. Uh, no effort was made to, to have plantings or anything, but they have uh, developed natural vegetation and to where the reinforced soil 
part of it is, is essentially going to be hidden, a very green solution. Uh, a good friend of ours, Steve uh, Gale, uh, started doing this in Minnesota back oh, probably 15 or 20 years ago. Now a number of manufacturers have these baskets or, or face elements to support uh, just synthetic reinforced soil during construction. And they again permit, permit vegetation to grow. I had an opportunity to visit uh, Colombia last uh, September and uh, got these slides from uh, a number of Colombian engineers showing uh, no, uh, some wonderful green solutions. And uh, you can see those there, the sandbag down here in the uh, lower left. Uh, these bags are about half full of an organic soil. Uh, sometimes they put a little lime in there or something that will enhance the vegetation growth. They stack them up so it provides the face element and then of course the medium for plant uh, growth. There you can see the slope over here in Medellin. This is the way it looked after a, a few weeks. And you can see the housing developments. The housing is still under construction. Uh, sometimes it's a combination of a reinforced soil wall and a, and a block wall or a stone wall. Uh, same thing here in Medellin. The houses are quite close together. That's a, quite a steep slope. Uh, it's a reinforced soil slope and performing beautifully. And uh, the last one I want to show you, I got these slides from a civil engineer, Luis Fernando Cano, in Medellin, and he said that you're welcome to use these slides, but please tell your friends in North America that not everyone in Colombia is a drug trafficker or a gorilla. And so, Senor Cano, I'm very happy to report that. Uh, he's been doing these kinds of things for about 20 years with geosynthetics and some remarkable, uh, remarkable uh, structures. And, so I'm proud to, to relate to some of the work that the Colombians have done. And in Northern California, Northern Idaho, the, the lower left, or lower right is one of Barry Christopher's jobs, or, and I think uh, Jorge Zornberg was involved on that. If you get a chance, go to the Jaeger Airport uh, website. Uh, I was not able to uh, steal some of their drawings or some of their photographs. They have a series of nine or ten photographs of the, of the construction of this, including the completion of this this uh, runway extension and it's a, or a safety area. Now, this is a remarkable reinforced soil slope. This is full-size construction equipment, D9s, carryalls, dump trucks there. So you can get an idea of the scale of that structure. It's quite remarkable. And then some other wall faces. And uh, Professor Tatsuoka uh, was kind enough to give me this slide of uh, the performance of a GRS wall uh, after, before and after the Kobe earthquake. And you notice this is settled, and it probably moved, but it did not fall down. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, geosynthetic walls and slopes have really come a long way from uh, the experimental, small-scale, low-risk uh, installations to not, and not being readily accepted to essentially routine uh, applications in so many areas, and I mentioned some of those in, in the beginning. If you'll permit me to make some uh, predictions, GRS soil will soon become the standard steep slope and standard wall. Uh, and there, this is because of all those advantages that I've, I've mentioned in some of the examples that I've shown you. We have a few technical and professional issues remaining, and I hope the GI, especially, uh, well, my academic colleagues, I hope, will take care of those technical issues and the professional issues, I think, is the GI, ASCE, and ASFE, I hope we'll be able to handle those. Now, another prediction for my uh, academic colleagues is that GRS and other types of reinforced walls will change the way we teach earth pressure theory and the design of backfilled retaining structures. And it may even change our approach to slope stabilization. Finally, I would like to acknowledge with thanks uh, my former professors, two of them are here, uh, Ray Kreisick and St Steve Poulos, who taught me uh, soil behavior, soil properties at, uh, at Harvard, uh, Bob Lucas and, uh, and Clyde Baker, who uh, taught me an awful lot about deep foundations and other foundation things in, in Chicago. A uh, number of you colleagues have been uh, enormously beneficial in, in my professional development. I'm thinking of, for example, of Milt Haar and, and, um, and the late Jerry Leonards at Purdue, and uh, many, many students whom I've learned from. Both, all of you have taught me uh, geotechnical engineering as well as geosynthetics engineering. Uh, 
my two UW colleagues, Steve Kramer and Pedro Arduino, who are still courageously trying to teach me modern <laughs> developments in geotechnical engineering. The GI board for this honor, my wife Cricket Morgan for her patience and support throughout the years, and I thank you ladies and gentlemen, and I say I should have been ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did it go too long? No, no, oh, you, you finished all of that. Oh, good. You want me to sit down? Oh, yeah. stand over here. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thanks for that wonderful historical overview of, of geosynthetics, uh, a very concise summary of, of design and property issues, a thought and hopefully action-provoking discussion of the professional issues uh, that we need to deal with on reinforced slopes and walls construction. Uh, and then that nice closing with some examples of context sensitive uh, design using reinforcement, which is, I want to remind everybody, a very sustainable technology. We're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're using the soils, mobilizing the soil's own strength to support it, and, and I think it already really has become the default system for our earth retaining structures. So once again, please join me in thanking Bob for his Terzaghi lecture.